Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lahari here from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology and today's lecture is about projection geometry and an ideal radiograph. So we are talking about certain important aspects of producing an ideal dental radiograph. The lear learning outcomes would be to define image characteristics of dental films, that is density, contrast, sharpness, resolution, spe speed, latitude, noise, and to explain the factors that can affect the radiographic image. Uh, describe two methods of object localization, the indication slop technique and what is right angle technique. And also to identify and describe causes of faulty radiographs. And radiograph is actually a two dimensional image of a three dimensional object. And if we all know here that uh, a tooth structure is a three dimensional object. So when you take a radiograph, you're actually only seeing uh, it in two dimensions and the buccal superimposes over the lingual and there is superimposition of findings as well. Characteristics of an image uh, of an x-ray film would be radiographic density, contrast, speed, film latitude, radiographic noise, sharpness and resolution. The overall image quality is a combination of all of these features. Density is defined as the overall degree of darkening of an exposed film. And if you notice here in this image where you're seeing multiple bite wing radiographs, you see that the density of picture B or radiograph B is more because there is overall degree of darkening is more in comparison to uh, the one seen in A or C for that matter. So the density depends on the exposure. If you increase the current or the voltage, then uh, exposure time increases and more photons reach the film and density increases. Density also of the image also depends on the thickness of the subject. If the subject is thicker, then more beam is attenuated and the image is lighter. So if adult exposure is used for a child or an edentulous area where there is less amount of subject thickness, then you end up getting a darker image. So subject density also influences the overall density of the image which means that relative densities of objects which are seen on the film image like metal restoration is more denser than that of enamel, more that of air dentine or cementum, that of bone, muzzle, fat and air. So a denser object is a better absorber and hence casts a radio opaque or a white shadow on the radiograph. That means a metal object will cast a white shadow and a low density object is a weak absorber, lets all the x-rays pass through it and casts a black shadow. No wonder the enamel is white and the pulp is black or radiolucent. Contrast is a range of densities on a radiograph. It is the difference in densities between light and dark regions. High contrast means the image shows you both light and dark areas. And low contrast means the image shows only light grays and dark gray areas. This, for example, is a gray scale. Now, the human eyes are adapted to recognize various um, shades of gray in the gray scale. So, radiographic contrast is influenced by subject contrast, which means that it depends on the thickness of the subject, density and atomic number. Uh, as well as the uh, voltage, the KVP of the X-ray beam increases, the subject contrast decreases. Also film fog, uh, increased density of film due to improper safe lighting or storage at high temperatures and developing at high temperatures. Scattered radiation also make, has a bearing on the contrast. So if you were to compare these two images, can you tell me which one has better contrast? The answer is obviously the image on the left side because it has better visibility, the clarity is better. So this difference that you're noticing is because there are many shades of black and white, whereas the image which has poorer contrast has many shades of gray and appears dull and having 
uh, not a good appearance. So when you compare, put the same analogy to radiographs, it's very easy to understand that figure or image B or the radiograph B has low contrast and radiograph A has got better contrast or good contrast. Reason being, you're able to define that uh, B has got more shades of gray and is looking dull in comparison to A, which has got better contrast and you're able to define what is radio opaque and radio lucent very clearly. Film fogging, on the other hand, happens because of reasons that we just discussed is due to uh, improper storage of films or high temperature of processing or storage, which results in fogged appearance and low contrast and difficulty to uh, diagnose the image. Moving on to speed is the amount of radiation required to produce an image of standard density. A fast film requires lower exposure to produce a density of 1 and slower film requires longer exposure. So we are very aware that uh, speed F or inside films have a better speed compared to E or D. Uh, also, these F speed films or the newer uh, films require lesser amount of radiation exposure and that is what is meant by speed so inside requires only half the exposure time and half the radiation dose of a d speed or ultra speed film film speed depends on the size of the silver halide grains and content of silver the f speed uh, films that we use nowadays have tabular crystals and have more silver content in them compared to the e-speed films which had globular or more rounded um, silver uh, grains because of which they have less surface area for usage. The speed of a film can be increased by processing at higher temperatures but uh, you would end up getting fogging and graininess as well. Also, speed of the film can be lowered by processing in deplete solution. So, you, it's better always to use fresh processing solutions. Moving on to film latitude. It's a measure of range of exposures that can be recorded as distinguishable densities on the film. So, a film which has a wider latitude can display a wide range of subject contrast, useful to see both osseous structures of the skull and soft tissue structures of the facial origin that is seen in the cephalometric image over here. Radiographic noise is the appearance of uneven densities of a uniformly exposed radiographic film. So the main cause of noise is radiographic mortal or artifacts. Mortal means uneven densities resulting from physical structure of the film. Example, uh, film graininess seen when high temperature is used and artifacts which are defects caused by errors in film handling like fingerprints, bends, processing errors or scratch marks. Sharpness and resolution. Now, sharpness is the ability to define an edge precisely. For example, the ability to see dentino enamel junction or a thin trabecular plate clearly on your final radiographic image. Resolution or the resolu resolving power is the ability of a radiograph to record separate structures that are close together. How well a radiograph is able to reveal small objects that are close together. These are independent and determine the clarity of the image. So a clarity of the final image depends on the sharpness and resolution. Um, resolution is measured as the highest number of line pairs per millimeter that can be distinguished. This is an image which shows you a line and a pair. That means line pair means line space, line space. For example, panoramic radiograph can resolve five line pairs per millimeter. In the space of one millimeter, your eyes are able to distinguish five lines and the spaces between them. Whereas an IOPA film or an intraoral periapical radiograph has better resolution. It allows you to visualize 20 line pairs per millimeter. In comparison, a digital image seen on a computer screen also theoretically has 25 line pairs per millimeter resolution, which is, you can say, equivalent to that of an intraoral periapical film. So it's important to understand here that smaller views, intraoral views, where the image is closer to or the receptor is closer to the tooth, 
always have better resolution than larger areas imaged like panoramic radiographs, especially when the receptor is extra orally placed. This is what is resolution when it comes to photography or sharpness. You can see that one side of the eye is more sharper or clearer than the other side, other side eye, which gives you an understanding that it has better sharpness and better resolution. Similarly, when you're comparing the same to photography, a low contrast, high resolution image versus high contrast, low resolution image and high contrast, high resolution image. So it's very clear to understand this image of the stork is best on high contrast and high resolution. So how do you minimize loss of image clarity then? Uh, first of all is to use a small effective focal spot, increasing distance between focal spot and object and by using long open-ended cylinders for uh, performing your x-rays and minimizing the distance between object and the film. So to avoid image size distortion, it is important that there is a distance of at least 8 to 16 inches between the x-ray source and the uh, object and the film. Also, to reduce image shape distortion, which results due to unequal magnification of different parts of the same object. This happens when not all parts of the object are at the same focal spot to object distance. Now, it's important to understand that the position of the film being parallel to the long axis of the object and orienting the central ray perpendicular to the object and film results in no shape distortion. When we're talking about size and shape distortion, it is important to understand two terms, elongation and foreshortening. Elongation of a radiographic image results when the central ray is perpendicular to the object, but not the film. Here you see that the x-rays coming from the source are 90 degrees to the tooth, but the film is not at 90 degrees to the, um, uh, sorry, the film which is here is not at 90 degrees to the uh, tooth which ends up giving you an elongated image. Similarly, foreshortening of a radiographic image results when the central ray is perpendicular to the film but the object is not parallel with the film. So here you can see that the x-rays coming from the x-ray source are actually at 90 degrees to the film but the object and the film are not parallel to each other. Head positioning of the patient in your dental chair before you take an x-ray is very important. The head position for all maxillary periapical radiographs must be a maxilla parallel to the floor. And when you're talking about mandibular radiographs, uh, the head position should be adjusted such that the mandible is parallel to the floor. When you have correct position, projection of central ray, the ideal image would show you the correct size of the actual object or your tooth. But foreshortened image caused by projection of central ray from an angle that is too great would end up dwarfing your tooth and making them look smaller. On the other hand, an elongated image caused by projection of central ray from an angle that is too small would end up causing elongated image. Now, this is very similar to the example of your shadow when you are standing under the sun. So, a shadow, your sh size of the shadow when you are standing under the 12 o'clock sun is very small. Whereas, your size of your shadow when you are standing under the 4 o'clock sun, evening sun, is longer. Reason being the angulation of the sun. Now that we've spoken about vertical angulation, let's look at what happens if the horizontal angulation is changed. The correct image resulting from proper horizontal angulation or proper horizontal projection of the central ray when the central x-ray pa passes uh, at 90 degrees to the film and the embrasures between the teeth or the long axis of the teeth, you get very good proximal contacts and a correct horizontal angulation. Whereas if there is a change in the horizontal angulation, there are overlapping images which causes uh, caused because of this incorrect horizontal angulation and uh, the proximal surfaces of the teeth seem to overlap each other which would 
result in uh, this area being obscured and we end up missing findings in this area. So therefore, based on what we have discussed, all the characteristics of the image and projection geometry, an ideal radiograph like the one which is seen in this picture here is the one with good density and contrast, has all the teeth of interest covered, shows at least 3 mm of bone below the um, apex of the tooth uh, so as to identify if there is any periapical pathology. There is no image shape or size distortion and no processing errors. Let's move on to the next part of this lecture, which is object localization. Now, this is a relatively new topic for those who just started learning a dental radiology. So I would want you to play, pay, uh, pay, sorry, pay close attention. And uh, if you still do not understand, we could do this exercise in the clinic as a routine procedure, which would make a lot of things clearer for you. So object localization has two different techniques. Number one is a right angle or cross sectional technique where two projections are taken at right angles to each other. And the tube shift technique or the buckle object rule given by Richard in 1952 or Clark in 1910 um, and has a very famous uh, mnemonic called SLOB, slob, which is same lingual opposite buckle. I'll tell you more as we look through each one of these in details. Now, why do you need object localization? Number one is localization technique using radiographs for pathosis, that means for a pathology, for supernumerary teeth, for fractures and for foreign bodies. Now in the right angle technique, uh, it is very simple. When you have taken an image and you are unable to localize, for example, this canine, which is the object that we are talking about here, and you are unable to make out whether this is actually buccally placed or lingually placed uh, in your arch, then it is important to take two images which are 90 degrees to each other. The first image is a usual periapical radiograph taken for canine projection. And the next one is an occlusal view, a maxillary cross-sectional occlusal view, which is at a different angulation, literally 90 degrees to the first angulation. So that's why it's called as a right angle technique or a 90 degree angle technique to give you the information as to where this canine is located. From this, Occlusal view, it gives you a very clear idea that this canine is located on the palatal aspect of the lateral incisor and hence if this canine were to be um, orthodontically uh, pulled back into its place or it were to be surgically excised, then you, are, you already have a clear idea of where the um, surgical opening has to be done. Now, the buckle object rule states that when two different radiographs are made of a pair of objects, the image of the buckle object moves relative to the image of the lingual object in the same direction that the X-ray beam is directed. Confused, right? Yeah, I, I understand. Totally. So, let me explain to you this clearly. Now, imagine that you have taken two radiographs of the same object which you are trying to locate. Now, the object in question for us here is this radio opaque bead. Now, this is an example. Now, what we're trying to tell you is that if this radio opaque bead is located lingual to the arch and you have done an image A, the first image, and the a resultant radiograph gives you the appearance of this exactly at the apex of the second premolar. Now you want to confirm whether this radio opaque object is on the lingual side or the buccal side. Now this is a cross-sectional diagrammatic representation but in reality when you see a radiograph like this you have no idea whether this object is located lingual to the arch or buccal to the arch. Remember a radiograph is a two-dimensional uh, view of a three-dimensional object and lets you see this only in two dimensions. So you are in no position to say whether this object is buckly placed or lingually placed unless you have taken a similar radiograph in the same position with the same um, placement of the film and you have shifted the x-ray machine to one particular side. Now either you shift it mesially or distally. 
Now, when you shift your x-ray machine mesially, it means you can see more of the mesial tooth. Like you see in this radiograph, you can see the canine as well and less of the second or third molar. So, you've given a mesial shift. So, when you've given a mesial shift, you have noticed that in your resultant second image that you've taken, the object of interest also has moved mesially, which means it has moved to the same side as your x-ray machine. Now, that brings us to this mnemonic, which is same lingual opposite buccal technique. If your object is located, wherever your object is located, you have moved your x-ray machine and taken a second image and if the in the uh, second image the object of interest has moved to the same side as your x-ray machine x-ray tube huh? don't forget about the angulation i'm ta talking about the x-ray tube here it means that the object is located lingually now let us give you an example of similar situation where the object is located buccally right and we do not know we've got the same image now if you compare image a of this image to image a of here this is exactly what i'm trying to tell you because your x-ray is a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional object whether the object is located on the lingual aspect of the arch or the buccal aspect of the arch the resultant image would look very similar to this so you're not in a position to say whether this object is on the buccal arch or the lingual arch so how do you make out Again, similarly, we have shifted the cone onto the lingual side, uh, sorry, onto the mesial side. So, in this um, second image that I'm talking about, let's say we move the tube mesially. What we would notice is that the object of interest in the Im image taken the second time has moved to the opposite direction. So, whereby same lingual opposite buckle this object is located on the buccal side of the arch. So, um, object localization is basically restricted to um, finding out if you have an impacted tooth or a foreign body or a fracture line and you want to ascertain whether it's on the lingual aspect of the arch or the buccal aspect of the arch and you're having difficulty in understanding that based on a single radiograph, you take another radiograph in the same area with uh, as close to the first one as possible just that you change the angulation uh, to explain to you this further now this is this is what i'm talking about horizontal shift in the x-ray machine where you are shifting it or changing the position of the x-ray tube either in the mesial or the distal direction now let's say our object of interest is this object in red and yellow here located on the uh, palatal surface of the arch and then you have the film which you have placed here and when you take an image you've got this first image with film A which shows you that this object is located exactly identical to the um, mesiobuccal root. Then you've taken a shift technique and you've changed the angulation and moved the x-ray cone distally right that's why you're able to see more of the second molar and when you've moved it distally you've changed the horizontal angulation you've noticed that the object has moved the same direction as your x-ray machine so that means that same lingual opposite buckle this object is located palatally or lingually some more examples in the diagram at the left, the buccal, that is the yellow object, that is here, yeah, and the lingual, that is red object of interest, are superimposed on each other because the beam is directed perpendicular to both of them. And they are in the same relative position, mesiodistally and vertically. So both images are located above the second molar. Now you want to make out whether which, which of these objects are lingual and which of the objects is buccal. What we do is we change the x-ray cone uh, and move, move it in horizontal uh, direction. In the diagram at left, the tube head, that is x-ray machine, also called as tube head, is moved distally and the beam is directed mesially. On the radiograph, the buccal object of interest, the yellow, moves mesially opposite to tube head movement uh, in relation to the second molar and lingual object of interest 
red moves distally same direction as tube head in relation to the second molar. So, S L O B same lingual opposite buckle. You could also do a slop technique or object localization also called as tube shift technique by shifting the tube in the vertical direction. In the diagram at left, the buckle or the yellow, uh, the one in yellow and lingual one in red uh, of both objects are superimposed on each other because of the beam being directed perpendicular to both of them. And they are in the same relative position means you distally. Both images are superimposed over the mandibular second premolar. So when you move the x-ray machine in vertical direction, let's say we've taken it upwards, the diagram at the left, the tube head is moved upwards and the beam is directed downwards. On the radiograph, <coughs> the buccal object of interest moves down in the opposite direction of the tube head in relation to second premolar and the lingual object of interest, which is red, moves up in the same direction as the tube head. So again, proving SLOB, the one that is placed lingually. Right, when the tube head is moved mesially with the beam directed distally, the two canals which are initially superimposed uh, will separate. The lingual canal, red arrow, will follow the tube head movement and the buccal canal will move in the opposite direction as seen on the canine film. I have another question for you. Where does the tip of the cuspid lie relative to the root of the left lateral incisor? Now in the image 1, you can see that the canine which is impacted, the cuspid is very close to the lateral incisor, right? And then when you take another image with a shift technique, you realize that the cuspid has moved closer to the central incisor. Now how do you know which, which side the tube has moved? Simply based on the direction of the premolar roots and which teeth you can see more clearly. So based on the direction of these roots and based on the teeth which we can see clearly, we assume that the x-ray cone was shifted mesially. Yes, and hence the canine also has moved in the same direction mesially. That's why it's located on the lingual aspect of the palate. Images of roots tilt in the same direction in which the x-ray beam is directed. Root A lies on which side of root B? Um, you look at this first image where A and B are overlapping over each other. It looks like uh, the A is crossing its legs over uh, B. But when you have done a shift technique, now this is an example of vertical shift technique, you've noticed that you can see more of below the um, mandibular um, lower border of mandible region and hence you can see that the uh, root A has moved in the same direction as the x-ray machine. So root A is located lingual to root B. This is an image of two impacted uh, supernumerary teeth. Where do the crowns of supernumerary teeth lie relative to the roots of the erupted teeth? Based on image 1 and image 2, you clearly notice that image 2, the movement of the x-ray machine or tube head has happened more mesially because you can see more of the canine. Hence, we notice that the location of the teeth also in the first instance is closer to the second premolar, for example, this supernumerary tooth. You would notice that it is overlapping more over the pulp of the supernumerary tooth and has moved in the same direction as the tube head. And hence, both these pre supernumerary tooth are located lingually. Now, in some cases, it is difficult to tell the exact position and may not be as easy as the cases that we have seen just now. For example, this canine, which is look impacted somewhere closer to the midline, and it is virtually impossible even in on sh tube shift technique to exactly locate it. So in this kind of situations, whether it's located more closer to the palatal ridge or more closer to the lingual, uh, I mean, uh, buccal ridge is difficult to tell even when you've taken multiple uh, right angle techniques or even shift technique. This sort of situation can best be uh, sorted out with the help of a CBCT. So uh, CBCT 
can help you exactly localize it because it's a three-dimensional imaging and uh, there's more radiation involved and it's a diff diff different technique and uh, obviously cannot be done chair side and it requires um, equipment and um, considerable time and definitely but it gives you the right answer. Now that was about object localization. Just lo let us look at something into peripheral eggshell effect. Now what, what we mean by this is that when you take a radiograph of a uniformly dense uh, object like this egg, for example, the shell of the egg is calcified and has uniform density all along the uh, all along its surface. But when you take a radiograph of this egg, you will notice that the calcified um, shell is actually visible as a thin radio opaque margin all along the rim of the, um, the egg itself. So this is exactly how uh, in, uh, in the head and neck region you will notice that even the lamina dura appears as a thin narrow radio opaque line along the roots whereas it actually covers the entire root uh, socket of the tooth. Also, the maxillary sinus. The sinus floor actually covers the entire um, root surfaces and is a nice hollow cavity which is lined with bone. But when you take a radiograph, it appears like a thin radio opaque uh, rim and uh, with radiolucency within it. Also, when you see cystic areas in the oral cavity, for example, this large dentigerous cyst here with sclerotic margin with a tooth impacted inside, you will notice that it appears like a eggshell, thin radio opaque rim all around, whereas in reality, the entire shell is actually having the same density of bone. That brings me to the last part of this lecture, which is faulty radiographs. Now, poor quality radiographs contribute to loss of diagnostic information, loss of professional uh, time and patient time as well. Common problems in film exposure and development would be light radiographs or dark radiographs. Light radiographs can occur as, as a result of processing errors like underdevelopment, depleted or diluted or contaminated developer and excessive fixation. Under exposure like insufficient current, voltage or time, film packet being reversed in the mouth leading to a tire track appearance, film source distance being too great. Dark radiographs on the other hand can happen due to processing errors like overdevelopment, concentrated developer, inadequate time in fixer, improper safe light or accidental exposure to light or expired films. Overexposure leading to dark radiographs can happen due to excessive current, voltage or time and film source distance being too short. There are other um, faults that can be seen on film based radiology like film fogging which is caused due to improper safe lighting or light leaks, overdevelopment, deteriorated films or contaminated solutions having insufficient contrast leading to underdeveloped, underexposed or excessive um, voltage or film fog, um, dark spots or lines which can be visible as fingerprints, static discharge, excessive bending, film contaminated with developer before processing, yellow or brown spots caused by insufficient washing, contaminated or depleted solution, light spots caused by film contaminated with fixer before processing or contact with any con the container, blurring movement of patient or x-ray tube or double exposures. Now this is a, a big um, grid containing various types of faults and let me just go through each one of them. The first one here is due to patient movement that's why it appears blurred. This is an occlusal radiograph with brown spots in it caused due to insufficient uh, washing of the fixer and insufficient fixing. This is caused by watermarks on the uh, film. That means the film is contaminated with water and a little bit of fixer even before you have developed it. This is the tire track pattern caused by reverse placement of film. The pattern of the lead foil reflects on the uh, image. This is caused by double exposure. You can see all images jumbled up here. Two radiographs. The radiograph has been exposed twice. This is a sample of static electricity leading to streak marks or uh, bent marks on the image. This happens when you rip the packet off too fast 
or you have um, ended up bending the film. This is a light film with fog caused by, um, you know, processing error due to low development or improper storage of the uh, image uh, film. These are fingerprints caused by contamination. So that brings me to the end of this topic. I've covered quite a few areas. I would want to go back, you to go back and look at the textbook again and refer to some more uh, areas if you possibly read uh, the uh, chapter and uh, we can do the exercise in the clinics and then you, if you still have doubts, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.